it's just not right, people. <laughs> I was the recording, anyways. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here. Um, coming to you live from the new Waterloo Community Foundation office. Um, we moved to a new location a couple of weeks ago. So as you can see, I've got a much more blank background right now, but we're still definitely um, settling in over here. We moved into um, a common or a shared suite with a few other local foundations here with um, Otto Schweitz Foundation, Blackhawk County Gaming, and um, McElroy Trust. So it's fun that we have a whole kind of crew over here on East 4th Street. We're really in downtown Waterloo now um, and really excited to be here. We've already been talking about that, how it's fun to be able to walk down to Savvy Bean or to um, get lunch at Subsidy and, you know, all of the, the great things that are available um, just right outside our door now. So it's been great. Um, and we look forward to having an open house in, well, we're, we're going to wait till we fully settle in, but in the next couple of months here, we'll have an open house and of course, um, invite the public in to be able to, to see our new space. So we're excited about that. Um, and yeah, we are also excited to have Charles Pearson here with us today. I know we have a lot of new um, people who have registered. I, I I think they're connected to Charles. He has a following, I guess. And so um, we're excited to have some new faces here. Um, if this is your first time joining us, uh, my name is Paige Price. I am the program manager at the Waterloo Community Foundation. And we host this online web series called Windows on Waterloo on the first Wednesday of every month. And what Windows on Waterloo is designed to do is to just share about the work that's being done here in Waterloo. Um, so sometimes we have nonprofits sharing about the services they provide. Sometimes we are covering um, just different topics that are relevant to our community. Um, um, like next month, we'll have um, a few different organizations joining us to talk about immigration and refugee services. We have a growing um, newcomer population in Waterloo, and so we'll have a few people sharing about um, the impact that that has on our community, the opportunities that exist, the challenges that some of these folks are facing, and then the services that are in place to, to help and to fill some of those gaps. Um, and then the following month, we'll have our Waterloo um, School District Superintendent, Dr. Jared Smith, join us to talk about the proposed plans for a new combined high school. So we're really looking forward to that as well. Um, he has been doing some town hall meetings locally to share some details about those plans and answer questions, receive feedback, that kind of thing. So it'll be a similar um, similar content to those meetings. So um, a great online option to be able to get some of that information. So there's kind of my um, my commercial, like my highlight for what Windows on Waterloo is if you haven't joined us before, um, or if you always do, um, we're happy that you're here. We have a great faithful following too, and we're always so happy to see you all on this first Wednesday. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Today we have, um, he's a Waterloo native, Charles Pearson. Um, he's joining us. He is the founder of Pearson Consulting, um, and he works with communities to help identify historic resources, um, document those, and really consults communities on how to preserve and utilize those resources, whether it's for education, for tourism, um, economic, economic development opportunities. Um, and we, we met Charles maybe a little over a year ago and have just learned so much um, from him and about um, our community and, and the opportunities that exist. So we're excited for him to, to share some of those with us all today. Um, and we hope to have time at the end of his presentation for any question and answers. So if you have questions while Charles is talking, go ahead and drop those into the chat and we'll address those at the end. So with that, I will pass things on over to Charles Pearson. Welcome to Windows on Waterloo. <laughs> Okay, can y'all hear me? 
Yep, we can hear you now. There you go. <laughs> okay, let me make sure I can get the PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. And can y'all see me over there? Yep, everything looks great, Charles. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, one is an honor being able to do a project with the Wireless Community Foundation. Paige and Aaron just been the best. Um, ever since I was thinking about doing this historical resource project, I wasn't sure who I could work with. But from day one, these guys have been like on top of everything. But outside of that, I'll talk a little bit about myself. Pearson Consulting is actually a African American Historical Resource Consultation Group. What we basically do is we look at different cities, different communities. It doesn't matter if it's rural Iowa, if it's a big city. We look at their individual resources. And when it comes to travel and tourism opportunity, we try to see if, if their resources actually could be marketable. Um, so, for example, I'm doing some stuff at Iowa State. We're looking at the marketability of, of Tri Stadium along with Ames High School, along with uh, downtown Ames. We're also working in Muscatine, Iowa. They have, they have a, a large Hispanic population, but they have this powerful African American history. So, we're trying to figure out when it comes to connecting. Um, the new immigrants to early African American history, what that can look like. Um, I had the opportunity to work with uh, the National Park Service, uh, the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation, and we designed a, a bike tour of Black experiences along the Upper Mississippi River region. Um, I also had that opportunity as a consultant just last year. Uh, I worked with the city of Dubuque. Um, uh, and Wapsie Valley Archaeology, and, um, and we did a Black Heritage Survey of, of Dubuque County in the city of Dubuque. So I had an opportunity as a consultant to be at, some, at the table with some of the best people. It doesn't matter if it's conservation education, if it's historical preservation education, if it's protection, if it's preservation. I have, a, I have, I have like 10, actually, this is my 10th year in this business. I started in 2014 and it's, and it's 2024 so time has flown by real fast so what i'll do is I'll, I'll give you guys some examples of some of the projects i've done okay oh let me get this right let me do this okay okay there we go so this project right here uh is kind of unique i actually started it at east high school so I was working with a lady by the name of uh, Joyce Bennett. She had a class called IJAD. And one of the things I was looking at was a lot of the kids was walking back and forth to East High School from uh, the neighborhood, Unity neighborhood where Jesse Cosby Center and Cunningham School is at. And so the, the whole idea was how do we take local Black history connected to the community school district resources and make it part of the neighborhood resources. And so uh, back in 2018, I wanna say it was the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination, it's kind of like a big deal. And so I partnered with her class and the students basically designed a self-guided walking tour of civil rights experiences um, between East High School where the racial riots happened. Um, we included Lincoln Park because if you look at the history of Blackhawk County and you look at the history of, of uh, Warlington, he started with rail. It wasn't the Cedar River that, that gave us leverage, it was, it was the railroad. And people don't, I don't think people in Warlington understand that Lincoln during the Civil War gave Blackhawk County rail. And so what we wanted to do was figure out with the students, how can we make a connection with Lincoln Park and, and, and East, I want to say East 4th Street and Southern, which would probably include Southern Park, but how do we make a connection um, with our residents and people that visit our city to know that Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War gave our community rail? I think, I thought that was more important than like the other stuff people talk about when it comes to like, um, the, the P 
people that came here based on the great migration. You had you had these blacks that came here to work on the railroad. But I, I felt like if you carve history, like in Waterloo, we do a lot of carving when it comes to history. And so I felt like uh, the rail, the history of the railroad and the rail was very marketable with the kids. So um, that was like our angle when it came to the Iowa African American Heritage Trail. And so, so the other thing was, I said, okay, what about Clinton High School? You know, you, you Clinton High School, Ames High School, the Butte Senior High School. You had a, you have all these historical high schools that have this unique Black history and these urban communities that are connected to those communities that stories are lost and forgotten. So we kind of took this concept and um, took it to the next level. The other the other opportunities I, I had was, um, so when you, when you look at Mississippi, when you look at the state of Iowa and you look at the river towns, um, these river towns and these people in rural Iowa, they do a lot of outdoor recreational stuff. And I had a great opportunity to do some paddling, some some paddle explorations of Black history, and it blew my lid off that I was actually paddling and experiencing uh, Black history in Iowa. And the reason why I thought paddling was going to be important, maybe three or four years ago, uh, Buchanan County Conservation gave me a call. I was doing some history tours in Waterloo and the, and the conservation people called me. They said, Charles, um, we have a we have the only African American wildlife heritage area probably in the West. I, I want to say maybe in the United States, but that's kind of reaching. But in the Midwest, Buchanan County had the only black wildlife heritage area. But Buchanan County didn't have any black residents. And so one of the things he was trying to do with the Iowa African American Heritage Trail was add the county and the county's resources, which in this case would have been the, the heritage area, um, to our inventory. And from there, um, Buchanan County introduced me to the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation, was the organization that actually protected um, that location. And the Heritage Foundation was intrigued by the fact that they they protect history you know they, they protect land that's significant to our storytelling and and so i went from preservation to start having conversations about protection and a lot of that was because of uh going to places where outdoors is like a big deal um so, so the other thing I started noticing when it, when it came to the Iowa African American Heritage Trail program. Um, oh, just do it. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so when it came to the Iowa African American Heritage Trail, we want, I want the trail to be student driven from day one. I always wanted kids to be able to experience and explore black history because a lot of times you got a lot of urban areas you got like like a lot of low to moderate income communities, and some of these kids are trapped within that 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 circle. And so I felt like if I created a camp where kids could actually explore with me and um, help me do the inventory, help me document that the the stuff that I do with the youth, then I could go back to like let's say Mayor Hart, I could probably go to the Preservation Commission, I could go to Paul Hunting and Parks and Rec and say, look, can y'all use this inventory that these kids are doing um, as volunteers to help the city um, position us to be able to explore the community on the different platform? And so I partnered with, uh, her name was is Bettina Fabos. I don't know if any of y'all in the audience might know Bettina Fabos. I partnered with Bettina Fable. She does a program called Fortipan. And uh, I was working with also uh, uh, Dr. Meacham and Dr. Gloria Kirk Holmes. So it's, 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 a, it's a list of people I was working with, you and I. But Bettina was the one that really believed in the camp. So when it came to Black Life Youth Camp and, and having a platform to do the camp, she got the University of Northern Iowa to be our partner. I'm gonna say the University of Northern Iowa Foundation to be our partner. 
she helped me understand the business side of how this camp was going to have to function. But she also incorporated for the pan, her, her digital media component. She made it very clear how both things can work. The, the, the outdoor stuff I was doing with the kids, but also where they could also do digital media. And so from this camp being successful, now I'm looking at doing the Black Life Youth Camp at Drake University. Um, I just had a great conversation with uh, Betty Andrews. She does I Make Me a World. I'm actually going to um, do her program. But I had a conversation with her and some others that we'd like to have a camp in, at Drake University. I'm also working with some people at Iowa State University trying to have a Black Life Youth Camp at Iowa State University. And the reason why I feel good about these camps now is, is the success that we had here in the Cedar Valley um, with the camp. Okay. I think I talked a little bit about uh, the, the, the Iowa African American Heritage Trust. So this was kind of unique. Um, the trail caught the attention of actually the, the Minnesota Department of Transportation. So the Minnesota Department of Transportation was seeing some things I was doing with these river towns. And I had a conversation um, with some people out of Minneapolis, no, not Minneapolis, out of St. Paul, Minnesota. And they do these BIPOC programs, Black, Indigenous, People of Color programs. And one of the things that they were working on was having a, a multi-million dollar interpretive center, a Upper Mississippi River Interpretive Center. And part of it was trying to create Black experiences um, in Minnesota. So the two things that they were looking at, the DOT there, they're, they're heavily invested in non-motorized transportation resources. So when it comes to biking and driving to get experiences, Minnesota is like uh, at the top of their game. Um, Iowa isn't. So when it comes to um, non-motorized transportation resources and biking and driving, we, we we have some things that we're doing, but we're like way behind other states and what they're doing. But I was fortunate enough to go to Minnesota and they were like, okay, Charles, can you help us um, get add to the Mississippi River Trail? And I was like, well, before I do some stories in Minnesota, I have some in Iowa, right? And they, was like, they were like, really? I said, yeah. So I basically used the Quad Cities as the model. And um, I worked with the National Park Service out of uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Her name was Kathy. I can't think of her last name, but I worked with her. And then Andrea Bolton with the Our Natural Heritage Foundation and the Quad City Bike Club. And a couple of trail managers, MRT trail manager, and I was trying to work with some other trail managers, but they they lost a thing or whatever. But anyway, what we basically came up with is a self-guided um, bike tour of Black experiences in the Quad Cities, all the way from uh, stuff about Dred Scott, um, the Louisiana Purchase, Louisiana, uh, the, the treaty signing, the Black Hawk treaty signing, um, the oldest Black property, Matter of fact, I didn't want to talk about it. I'm going to show you. So before I get to the other slides, we had to make sure that diversity, diversity and inclusion was like a big deal for um, these outdoor groups. It, they, they had their own platform when it comes to diversity and inclusion, but it was more for like indigenous um, groups. So, so when it came to diversity the, the native american narrative was kind of like the dominant narrative but for some reason people like the idea of adding more black history to the outdoors so when it came to outdoor recreation when it comes to hiking you know that type of stuff they wanted more black history to be a driver to bring more people out to experience these places and so that was kind of like one of the topics we went through um, so to, to give you guys examples of what we did in Davenport, um, this map that, that you're looking at, 
is in the village of East Davenport. So if you've ever been to Davenport, um, the village of East Davenport is like a high, bougie, you know, one of, them, one of the comfortable neighborhoods that you don't have to worry about a whole lot, a lot of activity, a lot of walking. Their parks and rec is like in full swing and it's fully loaded with black history. So Rhody Sims, which is a unique story, Rhody Sims, um, she was a property owner in Davenport in the 1840s. Her daughter married this guy by the name of John Ward. Ward was the first black settler in Scott County and Des Moines. And he owned pretty much all that land that you see in that circle. A black man owned all of it. And he also has a unique story. His story starts with Booth, um, who I want to say whose son, Booth's son killed, killed Abraham Lincoln. Warwick was an indentured servant to Booth. So that's it. And then his wife was a cook in St. Louis for either Lewis or Clark, either whichever one of them was the governor um, after they did the expedition. She was like a cook for, for the governor. So, so you had this unique story like right there. The other thing about the village of East Davenport is that's where the 60th U.S. the 60th U.S. Colored Infantry gathered to sign a petition so they had the right to vote in the state of Iowa. So, so when it came to voting rights and and these Civil War guys, this is where it happened. And I think the other thing is is people who understand in the state of Iowa, we didn't have enough black men in Iowa um, to meet the quota that Abraham Lincoln gave to Governor Kirkwood. So a lot of people don't understand that a lot of the black soldiers that fought for our state, um, they were fugitive slaves. They got emancipated. So the majority, the majority of the blacks that actually fought for the state of Iowa during America's only civil war were like, they weren't even from Iowa. The other thing was um, they had modern women baseball stadiums. So, so what was so unique about um, modern Woodman, it used to be called John O'Donnell Baseball Stadium. And when they first built John O'Donnell, the, the white residents would not sell the stadium out. They, they wouldn't come out like they wanted. But as soon as you added Negro League Baseball to the stadium, sold out. So in Davenport, Negro League Baseball, let's see, this is say the Quad Cities, Negro League Baseball was huge. And I can't see how they don't have a museum to kind of connect people. I'm going to have a conversation with some people here about that. But um, Negro League Baseball was huge in that region. And so we had a, we had a chance to, 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 to go to some of the locations that Satchel Page, you know, had to stay at because they couldn't stay in the hotel. So they had like these little areas like Silvis and Cook's Point um, that some of these Black patrons would stay at. Um, Nahant Marsh to me is a model. It's not the same thing, but it's a model of what Smoky Row is in Waterloo. So if you talk about African American workers, if you talk about industrialization, a location um, that was a borough for labor workers, Nahant Marsh is, is kind of similar to. Um, Smoky Road. Oh yeah, and that's me right there. So, so the whole thing is, is when it came to when it, for me when it came to connecting people to the state of Iowa's African American historical resources, what I had to understand was we don't have no resource. We our state doesn't have any resources to go. I, I think bigger than that. When it came to historical preservation, so so if any of y'all in the audience knows about the certified local government program or or SHPO, State Historic Preservation Office, or the Iowa Department of Culture Affairs, or the Iowa Economic Development Authority. What people have to understand is all, if, if you take all four of those groups and you and you want to put together a plan for the black economy in Iowa, those Four groups would be at the table in some kind of capacity. There's five states. I'm gonna pick five states out of the Midwest, and and, and hopefully I can pick up where I'm going. 
So there's five states in the Midwest that has historical black neighborhoods and has African-American historical districts. So the five in the Midwest that has that is Ohio, I want to say Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Missouri. So if you go to all five of those states, their historic preservation commissions, their certified local government programs, their economic development authority, they all protected and preserved their African American historical resources. The state of Iowa is the only state that hasn't protected or preserved any of its African American historical resources. So when it comes to SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, it has no value for ethnic property owners. Because all you have to do is use black property owners as the example, because a lot of the locations that are historically associated with black history eventually is going to be associated with other ethnic groups in their history. So 50 years from now, if you're Asian Pacific and you built up a community and y'all stayed there 50 years, you now qualify for the certified local government program. But the problem is, is I'll just speak on Waterloo. Waterloo's, Waterloo's Historic Preservation Commission, not even just Waterloo, Cedar Falls. Cedar Falls and Waterloo's Historical Preservation Commission, their guidelines cannot protect or preserve any Black people's properties. And so without the preservation or protection of the properties or, or without um, designating a district, a historical district, People don't understand really one in neighborhood should be the city of Waterloo's African American Historical District, specifically because of Highway 63. Highway 63 is, is your red line. So if you talk about the history of red line, that was the location. I told Bob Neymar, I told some other people, I said, look, I said, where we got our history wrong at is when you talk about the history of red line. Usually they have like a black content to it. You know, I'm talking about African American history when it comes to content. But you, Waterloo is different. What, what made Waterloo and Rail Line different was the Illinois Central Railroad wouldn't let the transportation people build a highway on their railroad. So we're Smoky Road. So we're Antioch Baptist Church, Union Baptist Church, uh Mobile Street, uh, Car not Carver, what is it? Uh, Cunningham School. Th that's that was supposed to be a highway for from rail line, but instead, because they had to build it somewhere else. So Plan B was like build a highway where it's at now, and and the, and the biggest sacrifice in the history of rail line. It wasn't the black community. I want to say it was the Sullivan family and the immigrants that lived where the Sullivan family lived at. So where Sullivan Park is at, really historically is where the red line is. And so the majority of the people that was affected by the red line or urban renewal at that time was the immigrants. And so if you look at even if you look at, at Sullivan Park now. As a memorial park, the majority of the people that service that park is African American. I'm gonna say maybe the past 20, 30 years, the black community has served that park. And the city, I think, understands that that whole area was was is an environmental hazard, maybe, or or a ghetto. And so when it comes to travel and tourism, um, there's really no opportunity. Um, in that region, because people are not looking at it as a destination, they're looking at it as an eyesore. And so what we try to do is come up with ways to um, connect people and, and reinvent the wheel when it comes to how people perceive our communities. And when it comes to culture here, just tourism, we try to take black history, just make it more inclusive. We don't want to change what people are coming to spend their money on. We just want to be part of it. And, and so that's what Pearson Consulting is all about. Um, 
my goal as a consultant is to be able to protect and preserve Black America. That was my goal from day one, 10 years ago, 2014. Um, I said, if I could help protect and preserve Black history in Iowa, that means I could do it in the United States. So, so that's one of my goals. So anyway, that's my little pitch. Um, I'm open for questions. If people have any questions. Yeah. Yeah, if anybody has any questions for Charles, you can go ahead and drop those into the into the chat and we will um, pass those along to him. Charles, I think um, to start as any questions come in, um, I know that you've had some kind of like some dreams about what implementing um, your expertise and and the things that you see here in Waterloo um, about what that could look like um, through like a trail system, um, walkable, bikeable, drivable, that kind of thing. And as you would, if you can kind of think about what some of the potential markers or stops on something like that would be here in Waterloo, um, could you share about um, what kinds of um, resources you would include in something like that? Just to kind of give us an idea of, of what some of this could look like here locally. Yeah, I'll give you a good one. So I think lately I've been talking to John. I've been having some conversation with Deer and Company um, in East Moline and Waterloo. I think the big deal for me when it comes to the history of agriculture and industrialization, you have, you have this unique timeline in American history where John Deere's was involved in the civil rights movement on a, on a big stage. And I can't think of the, the guy's name. He was the president of John Deere like in the 60s. He, 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 I think he's one of the last Deere family members. But anyway, the, the president of John Deere in the 60s, he did something unique. First, what he did was he started hiring black executives. Right. Deer, John Deere didn't have any black executives at the time. So the president of Deere's hired this guy named uh, Chuck Tony. And then Chuck hired this guy named Bill Cribs, who was from Waterloo. And they gave Bill Cribs the power to hire black supervisors at the foundry. So never in the history of Deer and Company, the world headquarters, did they have any blacks that have kind of like a title or power? So when it came to Waterloo, Iowa being the model of black professionals to supervise white professionals or other people, this was the home base of that. The other part of that piece is, is when it came to the John Deere Museum getting built. The museum had the opportunity to to have a display or an exhibit on behalf of the supervisors because some of the supervisors helped them raise the money to build the museum. But in 2024, there's really no black history in the John Deere Museum, but you have a lot of black contribution to John Deere, the company. So right now I'm talking to, to Deere and company. We're trying to work some things out. Oh, I got I got some other stuff. So I'm up here like in, in La La Land somewhere. So I think, I think another big one is the city. I partnered with the city in 2018. It was me, Abraham, the mayor, I want to say uh, Sandy over at, over at, uh, I can't remember her office. Then you had Paul Honey. But anyway, it was a group of us that when it came to civil rights history in Waterloo, Iowa, it was the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination, but it also was an opportunity to market Martin Luther King's experiences in Waterloo because his first visit to Iowa was Waterloo. So if you look at the history of Coretta Scott and you look at the history and, and you got to say Coretta Scott because Coretta Scott came back two or three times after King passed away. But Anime Wings kind of laid it out some years ago how we could all follow the footsteps and experience Martin Luther King's visit to our city. And there was one, one I, 
understand one time that we almost had a park um, dedicated to Dr. Martin Luther King specifically because of, of his significance. If, if what people got to understand, I help, if, I got a friend named Ryan Sal, he's in Dallas for a lot. And Mayor, Mayor Bill, Bill Gluber, he's retired now, but that's my guy though. Mayor Bill Gluber, he was a freedom writer, freedom seeker out of Davenport. When they found out that Martin Luther King received the Potsdamian Terrace Award, it's the, it's the second highest civil rights award in the world. And when he received it in Davenport, the first thing they did was build a Martin Luther King Interpretive Center in downtown Davenport. Why? Because Martin Luther King's only visit to the Quad Cities, they wanted to memorialize it, right? Uh, what, Grinnell, I want to say Grinnell College, they're doing some things to memorialize King's significance. People don't know that Martin Luther King's last visit to Iowa, he was going to go to jail. He had to be on the plane. He had to leave Grinnell to get to Waterloo, to be on the plane back to Atlanta because if he didn't, he was going to go to jail in Iowa. Now, what would that look like in American history for Martin Luther King Jr. to get locked up in the state of Iowa in a city called Grinnell? And he had the sheriffs, he had the sheriffs and everybody there. So, so to me, that would be another story that people need to buy into. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we had a question come in that's has or will Mount Moriah Church in Waterloo ever become designated as a historical building? Do you know anything about that site? I'm going to say it should be. This, this, this is what the problem is. So if, if you have African-American property owned that want to be partners in preservation, the city has to oblige to that. Right, the, the city has to put time and effort into assisting diversified people that want want to get the historical tax credit. Because the, the, the name of the game is, how can we save money to restore and revitalize this building? And and if we can restore and revitalize the building, now we can create jobs, we can create tax revenue for the city. But no, more importantly, we could be part of tourism. Every black person in the History of Waterloo, Iowa, that wanted to invest in protecting and preserving our city's history. The door got slammed in the face. Or because Dr. Belinda Creighton, I, I, the whole thing, I remember telling Dr. Creighton that the city and the community should be more. Um, supportive to have black people be partners in preservation because, because the east side of Waterloo, what people have to pay attention to is that Smoky Road really was your historical immigrant neighborhood. Smoky Road was home of the immigrants. You had, you had immigrants that were poverty stricken that was being discriminated by the industry, by rats, by deers, you know, they were discriminated against these immigrants. And these immigrants, these, these labor workers were here in Waterloo almost a hundred years before black people even got here. So when it, when it comes to our story in Waterloo, Iowa, um, we have to do a better job of telling the whole story and not just the pieces that can get federal funding um, for specific projects. Um, Charles, to kind of piggyback on that a little bit, um, I I think that um, when you talk about just sharing part of the story, it, re it reminds me about something we've learned from you too about um, the importance of illuminating historical truth, even when it's something that's hard or something that we're ashamed of um, rather than, and, and recognizing that instead of not talking about it or um, hiding that. Um, can you talk a little bit about our tendencies to want to hide some of those pieces of history and, and not talk about them? And 
um, just from your vantage, how you've interacted with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, so the city of Waterloo's story is different than a lot of other stories. We were in, we were in an industrial factory city, right? So if you go back to that timeline, for a factory city to function, you, you had to have some things to be part of it. One of it was you need bootleg. Factory cities needed alcohol, right? Factory cities needed prostitution. Alcohol prostitution was a huge part of the economy when it comes to the city of Waterloo. So when you have prostitution, gambling, and bootlegging in full effect, back then that was travel and tourism. Because people like R.J. McElroy, I don't know, have you ever heard of R.J. McElroy? The McElroy Foundation? R.J. McElroy had to sell alcohol and cigarettes to get people to invest in downtown Waterloo. So he went over to Cliff Supper Club to get the cigarettes and the booze that he needed to host the parties on his, you know, to get people to come down here. So the whole thing is, what what when people take history and cover it up, okay, let's say R.J. McElroy also was good when it came to radio and television. He made a great investment and was able to get KWWL. But R.J. McElroy also had kids out of wedlock. So if, if we talk about him having kids out of wedlock, if we talk about him having liquor and cigarettes to recruit people, now people are going to look at me and like, Charles, you, you threw us under the bus. No, I'm telling you the, 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 the true history of how he made our city great at that time. He had to have liquor. He had to have alcohol. If you look at um, uh, Church Row neighborhood, right? Church Row neighborhood was the home of white supremacy and systematic racism. That is, is just the fact. People don't, when I talk to people about Church Row neighborhood, they talk about the grout, they talk about whatever. But I tell them, if you were black and you were, if you walked through Church Road neighborhood coming from Sloan Wallace Stadium, every black family member say, look, go the same route and make sure you ain't by yourself. Because when the sun comes down, something might happen to you on the west side. Every football game, I remember walking to Sloan Wallace Stadium to all the football games back in the 80s. I'm an 80s kid, late 70s, 80s kid. And we all had to walk together. Because we, we knew that the west side of Waterloo had some white people over there that wasn't playing with the black people. They, they didn't play. Matter of fact, you had KKK members that lived on Wellington. So, well, so, so if you look at George Bush Park, not George Bush Park, if you look at George Washington Park, a park it's named after a person that just made crazy, stupid money off of slavery. It made sense to me that, damn, okay, Wellington Avenue is connected to that part, and that is where the KKK lived in, in Waterloo. West High School. West High School didn't even have Black people attend the school until the 50s. The first Blacks that that actually went to East was in the 20s. I want to say like the late 1920s, you had Blacks go to East. Blacks didn't even go to East until the 50s, and the first Black was Don Perkins' sister. And they thought it was Don Perkins, the football. So the football legend at West High School, the history people made it seem like Don was the first Black student at West High when it actually was a sister. I'm just, I could keep talking all day. We better take some more questions. No, that's great. Thank you um, for sharing about that. And and I think that leads into another question too. Of There are these, these hard parts of history, but I like how you said, like, that's part of like the story of these people that have made our city what it is and, and made it great. Um, and could you talk a little bit about how Preserving these stories and um, and sharing 
our history, how that's that's bigger for our community than um, it's important for us to all understand truth and for us to all understand um, the Black story here in Waterloo. But can you talk a little bit about like the cultural tourism part of that mm-hmm. and how um, how having um, these resources available for people, how that allows our current Black community to um, to profit and to benefit from, from having some of that um, kind of cultural tourism energy a little bit? Mm-hmm. So if you talk about economic development, the, the economy depends on travelers and tourists. It's, it's just part of the game. So when it comes to travel and tourism, people in Waterloo depend on that. People, de- people depend on uh, what's that event they do every year, the Irish Fest or whatever. People depend on all those people selling out our hotels, eating in our restaurants, that type of thing. So... In Iowa, the black economy has never ever been established. It doesn't exist nowhere. And so if the black economy doesn't exist, and we as the small business community are part of that travel and tourism conversation, that cultural heritage tourism conversation, then we can't really develop ourselves. We can't really reinvest. We can't invest. We can't restore. We can't revitalize. We can't do any new developments because we're really not here. Black economy is built around our history, our heritage. There's a region of Waterloo, Iowa that should be protected by the city. There's a region, there's a location in this city that can have economic vitality, just like in the South, where Black history is a $60 billion tourism. But here, here in, in I want to say the Midwest, I want to say the, the home of the union, that type of thing, we're not even in the million dollar tourism conversation. Our state, we don't even have to even bring it up. We got all kinds of Black people in Iowa, and we don't have a Black economy no we don't, we don't have an African-American historical district. If you look at Mobile Street, to me, Mobile, Linden, Beach, all that over there, Newell, to me, that's an African-American historical district. That's a location that Matt Gilbert and the Waterloo Historical Preservation Commission, there's no reason why they shouldn't protect it at all. There is not an excuse on this planet that the city of Waterloo's Historical Preservation Commission could not, could jump in and protect and preserve Black Waterloo. But instead, we talk about crime prevention, we talk about neighborhood watch programs, we talk about raking leaves and or all of that. And, and that is, any, anything to do with urban renewal is basically saying you live in a crime zone. Basically, anything to do with historical preservation, you're saying that you live in a, a thriving cultural corridor that's walkable, bikeable. You got all that other good stuff with it. I don't know if I answered your question, but long winded again. <laughs> no, that's okay. I think, um, yeah, I, I think that answered it because that's just something that I've learned a lot from you is about it's. Um, preserving these things, having the resources available. It's not just for education and so that we all all know about our community, as important as that is. But when you really zoom out um, that um, having these things available for tourism, for visitors, and for our own community, that, that's, that's profitable. And, and that's a win for everybody. Let me piggyback off of that. So sure. Black Hawk County, people understand Black Hawk County, you, you got 99 counties in Iowa. First 45, you had abolitionists, religious people kind of name their counties. The second 45 counties, you had white supremacists that practiced systematic racism, started naming counties. Black Hawk County was, from my research, named after Chief Black Hawk, 
who supported the Confederacy. The Meskwaki supported the Union. So when it comes to the history of the Confederacy and their staple in the history of the state of Iowa, our county is named after a Confederate Indian. Two, our county doesn't have a historical society. So when it comes to white, black, German, Irish, Scandinavian, African, no matter where you're from, if you have significance in the, in the city of Waterloo or Black Hawk County, we don't have a historical society. We, we give in a lot of our money in other communities, other cities, they have a museum that is used by taxpayer dollars. So it's like a city museum. The Grout Museum isn't a city museum. The Grout Museum is a standalone museum that's sucking up taxpayers' dollars when we need to have a city-built museum that could take care of the community as a whole. That's how I see it. But if somebody said, well, Charles, you know, he's off the record. No, we, the city of Waterloo needs another museum. I, I ain't saying get rid of the Grout Museum. But we need a museum that we can have our own historical society. We can have a Black Hawk County Historical Society. We can get some archivists. We got great people, white and black, that would jump in and, and inventory and take care of our community's history. But where we at right now, it's like, I don't know. Long-winded again. She's on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted now. Sorry about that. <laughs> and then I wasn't even looking at my screen. <laughs> um, Charles, do you have a story about a person, a place, a thing here in Waterloo um, that you would say is surprising or or maybe doesn't get the as much mention or publicity as what certain um, like historical stories do. Do you have just kind of a, yeah, something that is maybe surprising? The, just last week, they had uh, Mike Davis and the East Waterloo basketball team that won the state championship. Um, they had they, they had like a reunion and war ceremony. For them. And I just sat there and thought about it. I said, I said, Waterloo, Iowa produced four Mr. Basketball. So our city has produced four Mr. Basketballs in the history of the state of Iowa's basketball. And I said, guess what, though? I said, nobody understands that they played at Gates Park. This dude named Walter Reed and, and constituents started a program called Gates Park Youth Basketball League at Gates Park. And it produced four Mr. Basketballs, the most Mr. Basketballs in the whole state of Iowa. And I get the part where the city built this big old wall of China over there or whatever like that. But I still think that there's some history and interpretation when it comes to the Black community and what that same area means to the Black community, that the city could actually do some interpretation and give back to the four Mr. Basketballs and the GPBYL that was part of that same part. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, the the um, history of basketball at Gates Park goes way, 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 way back. There's and there's um, lots of stories that people are are still telling about um, playing there. So that's that's a fun connection to make. Um, somebody commented that they they love to hear your information. Um, and wants to know how citizens can support your work. Well, right now, we're looking for donations for the, the survey that I'm gonna be doing. I need to raise pretty close to maybe five, $6,000. So I have a fund with the Waterloo Community Foundation that they want to contribute to that. Um, the other thing is I'm gonna be working, once we get those resources developed, I'm going to be doing Black Life Youth Camp again. That'll give me an opportunity to share some of these stories with my campers this summer. Um, and what else? I got, oh, I'm doing, I'm working with Rag Ride. So any of you guys out there ride bikes or you want to do something different, 
Rag Ride is kind of unique because they start the ride on the Mississippi, I mean, not the Mississippi, the Missouri River. It ends on the Mississippi River. And both those rivers have a lot of black history. So that's one of the things I'll be doing this year. Yeah, can, Charles, can you tell us a little bit more about the Waterloo African American Historical Resource Development Project, the, the fund that you that you hold here? And, and um, can you just tell us a little bit more about the resources you're developing and, and the goal behind that project? Right. So so normally when you when you want to do like a trail system or if you want to do like a walking tour or something like that, you have an inventory of properties, right? In this case, the city has an inventory of properties that qualify for the national register. We're looking for properties that anybody can own and try to connect people to those properties. Um, I missed the last part that, that, that you asked me about. You, what was the last part you just asked me? Um, no, I was just asking what what the goal of that project that oh. you're fundraising for. Yeah, is. so 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 the big picture is to, is to create an inventory of African American properties that are significant to the Black community. Once you create that inventory, now you want to see what options you have. So, can we create a plaza? Can we maybe take some land and make another park? Can we create a safe route to some of the destinations? Do we need to do a restoration like the oldest church? The I want to say on the corner of Albany and Mobile Street, this church is, used to be called the Railroad Chapel. The Railroad Chapel was donated to the Black community and it became Payne EME Church. So, Chapel not only is significant to the Black community, but it's it has a big old hole in it. The roof needs to be fixed. It needs to be restored, revitalized. So those are some of the things that we can all do together it, um, when it comes to resources like that. So that way, when it comes to tourists and people that visit our city, we can say, look what we did as a community. We, we took the old railroad chapel that used to be Payne Enemy Church. We restored it. And now people can come take pictures and they can experience Waterloo on another Well, that's great. Um, Charles, thank you so much for, for sharing with us today. Thank you for the work that you're doing here to help us um, learn more about, about our history here in Waterloo and, um, and kind of think and dream along with you about, about how um, developing those resources um, can benefit our community. And we appreciate you taking the time to join us today to share more about it. Um, and are cheering you on as you as you continue this work here too. Um, and thank you so much to everybody for for joining us today as well. Um, we'll be sending out a recording of this presentation, and so keep an eye on your email inbox for that. Um, we you can share it or rewatch it however you however you would like. Um, and we hope that you can join us again for our next presentation here at Windows on Waterloo. It'll be Wednesday. March 6th, we'll be talking about immigration and refugee um, newcomers here in Waterloo, some, some trends that, are, that our service providers are seeing, opportunities, the challenges that, um, that some of these people are facing and how, and how we can um, help acclimate newcomers to our community. And then in April, we he we'll hear from our superintendent, Dr. Jared Smith, about the proposed plans for a new high school here in Waterloo. So keep an eye out for more information on those. We would love for you to join us again and hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day and a fantastic February. Thanks for being here.